Good morning, everyone. Uh, word, warm word of welcome to everybody who is joining with us on Zoom. And if you're a visitor, a special word of welcome to you. Uh, and Peter, uh, Richie from Nyan Hall, you're very welcome this morning. Um, we're just going to open our worship this morning by standing and singing the words of King of my life, I crown thee now, thine shall the glory be. Well, good morning, all those that come in during the singing of last, that hymn. Our call to worship this morning is found in Psalm 69, and it's verse 30 to 34. And it says, I will praise the name of God with song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an ox or a bull with horns and hoofs. When the humble see it, they will be glad. You who seek God, let your hearts revive. For the Lord hears the needy 
and does not despise his own people who are prisoners. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another morning to worship you. Lord, we thank you that we do not need to sacrifice animals, Lord, to please you. Lord, that the sacrifice was paid by Jesus Christ. Lord, he paid the ultimate sacrifice for each and every one of us by offering himself up on the cross. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you ask us to come to you. Lord, we are all needy. We all need rescued from sin. Lord, and we just pray that you would draw close to each and every one of us this morning. Lord, we pray for Peter as he brings a word from you, Lord. Lord, that he has prepared for us. Lord, we pray for those who cannot be with us this morning in person. We pray for all those that are watching online on Zoom or through the DVDs. Lord, we pray that you would draw close to them, Lord, that they would feel part of your church, Lord, that they would feel part of this service and they would be worshipping you in the same manner. And Lord, we just want to remember now, Johnny and Catherine, Lord, as they're traveling back to Mozambique, Lord, we pray that you would just comfort them, Lord, as I'm sure their sadness as they depart from their families, Lord, and draw close to their families here that are left with the worry and anxieties that they may be feel, feel at this time. And Lord, we just pray you would just give them travel and mercies. Lord, make straight their ways. Lord, as they head back to the Yao people, Lord, just help us be in prayer for, for them, Lord, that we would remember them and all that they're doing out there, Lord, that they're bringing their, your gospel to an unreached people, who have never heard the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray, Lord, you would just make, make every equipment available to them that they can share your gospel easily. And Lord, prepare the hearts and minds of those villagers out there to be receptive to your good news and turn to, towards you, Lord. Lord, help us in our village here in Strayed, Lord. Help us to be a witness for you. And Lord, we just pray this morning, Lord, as we come to worship you, Lord, that our hearts would be ready to, to worship you properly, Lord. That whatever happened in the last week, Lord, that we, we will have left it at the door. And Lord, we would just be focused on our hearts and minds on you this morning. Lord, that we would offer you true worship. Lord, just as you desire. And Lord, just help us and be with us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I have got off lightly this morning because I was supposed to do the children's address, but we have a special guest with us. And hopefully Nigel is online and Ruth is there too. Um, thank you for joining us. And I'm just going to hand over to you now to give us all an update of what you've been involved in. And um, just, yeah, we're looking forward to hearing what you've, you, you have been doing for the Lord. Good morning, folks, and it's good to be with you again. And uh, first of all, before I forget, I just want to thank you for your your uh, support and for your prayers each week. Um, we appreciate that, and we thank you for that. Um, we just continue to do door-to-door -door still in painting with the church there every Tuesday. And that's given us a lot of uh, good opportunities to share with people. In a number of uh, Jehovah Witnesses we've had contact with recently, and just being able to go back to them and, and leave other literature with them and have other conversations with them. Um, I just ask you to pray for three men. I think I mentioned in, in the last prayer letter I sent to John, um, three men we met one day with uh, terminal cancer. And the first man uh, said he didn't want us coming, confusing him. He had the whole thing sorted out in his own mind. And uh, sadly, he wasn't willing to have a, much conversation. But he just, he did tell us that he was riddled with cancer. So just pray for that man. And uh, the booklet and leaflets are left with him, he'll read them. We went uh, a bit further down the street in the after afternoon, we were visiting and met one man and um, 
he wasn't willing to chat at the beginning uh wasn't overly interested but the fellow was with me start talking to him about just other things and then eventually we got around to spiritual matters and i just was about to say to him well what if you uh went to a consultant someday and you got bad news and before i finished the sentence he said well like actually that is me and uh, he went on to tell us about how he had been to, for cancer treatment and they've tried all different types of new types of treatment upon him and none of, none of them have worked so just pray for that man and that day i had two booklets with me one was on suffering and one was on uh, the testimony of a man who had cancer and i offered him those two booklets and he was reluctant to take them but eventually he did take the little booklet on suffering and I went away from that door a bit disappointed that he didn't take both booklets. But it uh, went three or four doors up the street and we met another man who uh, also had cancer and also terminally ill. And um, it was amazing the way the Lord overruled in the whole situation because I had the second booklet then to give to that other man. And just pray for these men that they will read the leaflet uh, booklets and that through reading it that they will uh, come to faith in the Lord. Um, it's been encouraging working alongside that church and we have two men to come out, two or three men to come out on the doors as well. And it's just been really encouraging to see a number of folks recently starting to attend the church as a result of the door-to-door -door visitation. So uh, just continue to remember those folks. Um, just continue to remember the track distribution. Then we visit uh, there before Christmas to, with the late night shopping. I was out in some of the local towns and I usually go to uh, two different towns, uh, Tavistock and um, Launceston, at least once a week with tracks. And it's been amazing just to get conversations with people on the streets. Uh, there's one elderly lady there recently. Um, uh, she told me that she was a, um, a Mormon and she was willing to take a booklet on the Mormon faith and just the differences between the Mormon faith and Christianity. So just pr pray for those different contexts we've had on the doors. It hasn't been easy for the past two years, but it's been amazing though to look back and to see the way the Lord has literally led us to dozens of different people and we've been able to share the gospel with them, whether it be on the streets or on the doors. And uh, the Lord has just overruled. There's some things we haven't been able to do, but still it's amazing the way the Lord has led us to needy individuals and just to just happen to be at their home on that particular day you call or whatever. And uh, the Lord's been overruling. And, uh, in the midst of the COVID, the Lord is still at work and we need to take courage, uh, encouragement from that and even just take encouragement from the fact that some of these folks we've had contact with are starting to attend church. Now Ruth's going to share a little bit about her work. Good morning. Um, I just thought I would tell you a wee bit about the family too. Um, Eva and Samuel are doing well. Um, Samuel's 12 now and Eva's 13. Samuel started high school this year so that's been a big change for him and um, he's doing well he's on a special dyslexia program and he's really really doing well and Eva's picking her GCSEs so time flies on um can't believe it we blinked and they've, they've grown up but I just want to share a wee bit of what I do very quickly um through the pandemic I was really struggling to know how to serve and what way to serve and I'm an avid knitter. Don't laugh until you've tried it. It's a great stress reliever. It's a great hobby. And I decided to start a podcast and um, it's been going a year exactly this, this month. And I do a wee epilogue at the end of it, a wee spiritual nugget. And it's been amazing all over the world. I've had contacts with people who, uh, who need comfort or help or the Lord or know more about our faith. And if you uh, want to support us, <laughs> log into YouTube to Ruth Loves to Knit Podcast, subscribe. If you don't knit, take the notifications off, but it moves it up the, up the YouTube um, notifications and then more and more people could have the chance to hear the gospel. And it's been amazing um, the contacts that I've made just through putting a bit of wool on two needles and, and sharing um, God at the end of the, of the, of the podcast. Um, also, every fortnight I go into a local recovery centre, it's for women, with 20 minutes from us for alcohol and drug uh, recovery. There's capacity for eight ladies and it's been amazing to go in there and do devotions with them on Thursday mornings and to hear their stories and to be able to share in their lives. That's probably the hardest thing I've done since we've come here because um, you need to be a bit thick skinned and you need to not take things to heart too much. But it's amazing to be able to share with those ladies who've had such a hard life 
um, so many hurts in their lives, but just be able to just be able to be um, share a little bit of Christ and the love He has for them, even though they have very little love for themselves. Um, should have been back doing school assemblies, but obviously the dreaded Rona has hit those. So not I'm not able to go into schools for those. We had several booked for this month, but they've been put off to next term. And then I've become a governor at the little local primary school here, and. Um, just uh, the it's a church school and they, the principal felt that the church side of it has been lacking and she's asked me to come in um, as a Christian to um, build up the, the, the um, Christian side of it again. It's quite sad, actually, I think, because there is um, a Church of England vicar who Father Philip who is on the governors and yet they asked they had to ask me to come in to be the Christian influence, which is quite sad and quite um real here that um there isn't much uh, christian uh, biblical teaching going on in this area but we're still thankful that despite everything that's going on in the world we're able to still serve the lord here in this part of the world um and we just again want to thank you so so much we couldn't be here without the prayers especially over the last few years we're sorry we haven't seen you i managed to get home to um see my mum and dad for three days and then Samuel got sick, so we quickly flew home and then we all got COVID and we gifted it to my dad as well. Um, but we're all healthy, we're all well, we're all getting on with it. And as I say, just thank you so, so much for giving us this opportunity to share with you this morning. God bless. Thank you. That's great. We've got modern technology, can do these things now um, over in England there. And we have them in, in this little village of Street. Um, okay, just bear with me while I do go through some of the announcements um, for this incoming week. So um, again, Peter, you're very welcome, and you're going to be the speaker this evening as well. Uh, tomorrow night is our small group Bible study at 8pm. Um, so if you're free, come along to that. You don't need to be a scholar in the Bible. You don't need to have loads of understanding. Just come along and share as we uh, take some time out to, to look around the Bible and see what God has to say to us. Um, Tuesday morning, then, there's no mums and tots this week again. Wednesday evening is our uh, prayer meeting and Bible study again at 8pm. Then Thursday morning, if you can't make it out to Monday evening small group Bible study, there's another one on Thursday morning. So it will take the place of our normal Thursday morning prayer morning. So if you, can, if you can't make Monday night, there's the option for Thursday morning, so you'll be most welcome there. Then Friday evening is our youth work, so Pathfinders from 7 and uh, Straight Youth then at 8.15. Uh, next Sunday, then Sunday school is at the normal time of 10.15. Our morning service will be taken by uh, the Reverend Calvin Coulter, who is no stranger to us. Um, so Calvin is taking both services next Sunday. Then further on in the week, uh, sorry, uh, in the month, uh, a date for your diary is Wednesday the 26th is the Strayed, um, the, sorry, the Faith Mission your, uh, Rally. And that is, the speaker there is Ruben Lyons. And so if you can put that in your diaries for Wednesday the 26th at 8 p.m. Then a couple of magazines have arrived. So if you normally get the EFCC and Fellowship magazine, they are at the back. Then we have our devotionals from the word for today. So one for the older generation and one for the younger generation. So if you want to pick those up, feel free. They're at the back as well. So uh, our next hymn then is uh, Jesus Loves Me. So if we'll all stand and sing it together and then I will hand over gladly to Peter who will take the rest of the service.
forgot one other announcement. If you wear glasses and you haven't donated to the VISPA appeal, there's a box still out at the back that we're sending out old glasses. Um, so those will be getting collected soon. So if you have any old pairs of glasses lying in drawers, please bring them in and we'll donate them. Um, it'll make such a difference in the lives of those that can't afford glasses out there in Africa. So yes, that's the last announcement. So Peter, it's all yours. <laughs> <clears throat> thank you very much, Ryan, for the welcome, and thank you for the invitation to be with you this morning. Folks, it's good to be here, and I haven't been here before, so it's an experience for me as well, but well, hopefully it'll be a good one. But we're turning this morning, first of all, to Genesis chapter 8, please, Genesis chapter 8, and we're going to start, commence to read from verse 13. I come in off the um, A8 this morning, hadn't been here before, so by the time I had negotiated all those roundabouts and things like that, I don't know where I am this morning, okay? All I know is there's a Bible in front of me, so that, that's good, and that's a good start. But I've been as far north on this island as Fanad Head, I've been as far south as Ring of outside Cork, I've been as far west as Westport um, and Bandry down in the southwest. I've been as far east as Quinton Bay, and hand on heart, I have never been in strayed in my life. And uh, whenever I was asked to come, I had to go and look it up on the map and say, what exactly is that? I have a fair idea, it's Bally Clare direction, but I'd never been in it. And it is interesting when you, you know, drive around the country so much and to so many different places, there's still little places you haven't seen yet. And, but it's nice to be here and good to be with you this morning. Genesis chapter 8, and we're commencing to read from verse 13, and then we'll read a few verses from chapter 9 as well. And it came to pass in the 600th and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark, and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the seven and twentieth day of the month, was the earth dried. And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons, and thy sons' wives with thee. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of all flesh, both of fowl and of cattle and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. And Noah went forth and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him, every beast, every creeping thing, and every fowl, and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after their kinds went forth out of the ark. And Noah builded an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. And go across to chapter 9 and down to verse 16. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, this is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. Before we look at these scriptures this morning, consider them together. Let's bow again in a moment's prayer. Our Father, we bow in thy presence. We continue in thy presence in and through the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We come in his name alone, come upon his merit, none of our own. And we thank thee for the grace of God. Thank thee for the mercy and for the love of God toward us. We acknowledge the one that we bow before this morning, our creator, the sovereign God. And yet, Father, we thank thee for the things that you've revealed to us about thyself, one of those things being thy great holiness. And Father, we're conscious of it this morning, yet we thank thee we're able to enter into thy presence, and only by thy grace. Father, we thank thee for thy word. 
we want to be able to not only read and understand it this morning, but then take it and apply the truths and the principles to our hearts, that they'd make a difference in our lives. So we pray as we consider the scriptures together, we pray, Lord, that this message will be a blessing and a help to each and every one in their own personal circumstances and individual needs. We each need thee. So we pray that thou wouldst be pleased to move by thy Holy Spirit in our midst. Speak through the word. Move by the power of the Holy Ghost, we pray. Do thy work. Help us, we pray, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to take up the subject this morning of a new beginning. A new beginning. And I think that's what we see whenever we consider uh, the scriptures that we've read in connection with Noah and the circumstances that he found himself in. But in October 2019, Lego unveiled its first brand campaign since the 1980s. I'm quite sure that following the Christmas period, there's many of you, young and old, have, have been playing with Lego at some point or have seen it, right? It's one of those uh, toys that's always on the list year on year. But this new brand campaign back in uh, October 19. It was created by a French agency, BETC, and it was entitled Rebuild the World. And this huge project encompassed a, a live action adventure film. It was directed by multi-award winning uh, collectives and a series of, of Lego brick scenes that sent positive political messages about the power of creativity to enable change. This agency had met Lego 18 months before and worked with the brand's internal agency to develop the concept, rebuild the world. They thought about what would be important for Lego to say in the current day. BETC's founder, Remy Babinet, said they're one of the most loved brands in the world. Innovation and creativity are both brand and philosophy. But the problem Lego has is that while it's known for the educational aspect, of its product, that perception is a problem for all the parents who don't have an affinity with the brand. He said they think it's all about following instructions, but it's more than play or education. It's about creativity, he said. To be creative today is the way to achieve something, to navigate the new world. Mathematics and rationality used to be the most important skills, but now creativity is the most valuable skill, and Lego can enable that. He went on to say, we had no limits. The film that we produced is about what your imagination can do with Lego. Rebuild the world could be just for fun, or it could address issues in the world today. You can transform the world as you want. Rebuild the world according to Lego. What was it? It was a focus on creativity. It was about innovation. Rationality wasn't necessary. There are no limitations. Instructions don't have to be followed. Friends, listen. Noah's situation was very different. In a sense, he had to rebuild the world, didn't he? But not with creativity. Not with imagination not without rationality, not without limitations, and certainly not without instructions. Genesis, of course, is the book of beginnings. And when we turn to chapter 8 and verse 13, we find a new beginning. Genesis um, 7 and 1, just to, to look at at, at a bit of an introduction, as it were, to what we're looking at this morning. Take a look at Genesis 7, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. What a wonderful thing. Righteousness in a wicked generation. That was this man's reputation. That was Noah's reputation. And today, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, it should and it must be ours. Come thou into the ark. Come out of the world in that sense. Into the ark. And today, again, as believers, we are separate from the world in that sense. We are in Christ. We come to verse 4 of chapter 7. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights. And every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face 
of the earth. You see, there was the promise of judgment back in Noah's day. There was a severe judgment that was going to come. Friends, there's a promise of judgment today. Judgment is coming. We read the Scriptures. We find what has already come to pass. We look at what is yet to come to pass, and we know that God will judge. He'll judge the unrighteous. He'll judge the wicked. Verse 5 of chapter 7, Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. What was that? It was faithfulness. Faithfulness. And it is what is expected of us still today. How many scriptures, particularly in the New Testament, and as we read through those epistles, how many times do we read about being faithful and needing to be faithful? In verse 16, they went in. They went in male and female of all flesh as God had commanded him. And the Lord shut him in. The Lord shut him in. Noah would be the representative head of the human race going forward. God would protect him. God was about to do something new. In verse 17, we read, And the flood was forty days upon the earth. And the waters increased and bare up the ark, and it was left up above the earth. Those waters increased. They bore up that ark. It was lifted up above the earth. Does it not remind us in one sense of Christ himself? Lifted up above the earth. And friends, as he hung on Calvary's cross, judgment fell that day. And he endured it. He endured it on our behalf. That we could go free. That our relationship with God could be restored once again by the grace of God alone, through faith in Jesus Christ alone, not ourselves, not our works, nothing of ourselves, all in him. The protection, the security, the, insur the assurance is in him. There's six things I want you to consider as Noah finds himself a, a very important part of this new beginning that we find in chapter 8 that we have read about this morning. First thing I want you to think about with me is there's an assessment. An assessment. Chapter 8 and verse 13, it came to pass in the 600th and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month. It was a very, it was, it was the first day of a new year, a, a very new year. It was like nothing Noah or his family had experienced before. The ark had been completed. Noah and his family and the animals had entered. Judgment had fallen. The waters had subsided. He was about to disembark. This was a fresh start. He'd been confined for a long time, a very long time. Things had changed. He didn't know what lay ahead. The earth had never experienced anything like this before. He and seven other family members were alone in all this. And there was a great responsibility. If you consider your own circumstances this morning, friend, what do you face as we enter this new year? We've entered it, yes, just a couple of weeks, but look at what lies ahead. What do you face? I wonder what you have experienced in the year that has passed. Have those been good experiences? Have there been bad experiences? Have there been very difficult experiences? Think about Noah's situation again. The waters were dried up from off the earth. The conditions that had existed for so long had now changed. And we read that Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. The face of the ground was dry. God was renewing. Noah looked and became conscious of the conditions. Is there not an assessment here? Assessment is a wise and a necessary practice. I wonder, do you do it? Do you practice it regarding your own circumstances, in particular your ministry, your service for the Lord, whatever that may be? We need to do this individually, and we need to do it collectively as churches. What, what are the conditions that we face as we do so? Have they changed or are they changing as, as we have entered a new year? Are we in danger of going through the mechanics of service? Are we in danger of the comfort of activity? We're busy, therefore we're faithful. But it doesn't always work like that, sure it doesn't. 
The truth never changes. The message that we preach never changes as far as the gospel is concerned, but our world, and therefore our society, is ever-changing. It is ever on the decline morally and spiritually. Every generation has had its challenges, but as we've entered this another new year, we face more new challenges. There's no doubt about that. And the prophetic words of Christ himself are clearer than ever. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. There's much to learn from that particular passage where that's taken from in Luke chapter 17. But suffice to say, just for the purposes of what we're looking at this morning, man is going on in the things of this life. And in general, in general, does not believe the truth of God and is not heeding the warning of judgment. A judgment not by water, but by fire. And we're experiencing increasing antagonism against that message in order that it would be prevented and that we would be silenced. Why? For men love darkness rather than light. Those are the conditions, friends, if we take time to assess them. The question then arises, how do we respond to them? How do we address them? How do we prepare ourselves? How do we prepare our children? How do we prepare our young people to deal with them? What have I done for the Lord in the year that has passed? Have I been faithful? And if there is a means of measurement, and I appreciate that sometimes there isn't, but if there is a means of measurement, has it been effective? Will we resolve to be faithful in the year ahead, each of us, individually and collectively? And how can we do so? Assessment. Second thing I want you to think about here is adherence. Take a look at chapter 8 and verse 14. And in the second month, on the 7 and 20th day of the month, was the earth dried. The earth was now dry. Not just the face of the earth, but the earth itself. The earth was, was dry and could be inhabited. We read on, and God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee. He didn't leave until God instructed him to do so. This was adherence to the Word of God, what God had said. He spoke earlier on about instructions. Well, he took the instruction of the Word of God, and he, he moved by it. He obeyed it. He lived by it. Noah may well have been chomping at the bit to get out of that ark after being in it for so long, but he had to wait. Had to wait till the water subsided. Had to wait till the ground had dried. Had to wait until God said it was time to move. Delay can be difficult, can't it? But God knows best. And sometimes we have to wait. Preparation may be required. Maybe a time of study. Maybe a season of prayer. Maybe a time of practical preparation. And each of these requires our patience and requires our adherence to the Word of God and to the promises of God. We should note Noah's family responsibilities. He, he had his wife here. He had his sons here. He had his sons' wives here with him. They were with him as he entered these new conditions and as he went forth to carry out God's instruction. And we need to ensure, don't we, that we take our families with us. We need to make time for them. We need to live well before them. We need to be examples and good examples to them. And as believers, we have a grave responsibility to teach them before any Sunday school involvement or, or children's meetings or other ways to teach them the Word of God ourselves. Noah faced a daunting task, a world that had been full but was now empty. He had been part of a generation now he was to be the start of a generation. He had seen something that had never been seen before, and he was going to step out onto the earth and its aftermath. What lay ahead? What would these conditions be like? What would he have to do? 
he had known the immediate protection of God in the close confines of this ark. And now God was asking him to go forth out of that vessel. Don't think. Can I ask you, friend, this morning, is God asking you to do something? Is God asking you to go forth? You do so with the indwelling of the Spirit of God if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. The very presence of Christ and the revelation of God in your hand. Go forth at the command of God. There's assessment. There was adherence. Thirdly, I want you to see acceptance. Verse 17 of chapter 8. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of all flesh, both of fowl and of cattle, and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. What did he bring with him? He brought some of the people and some of the things of the old world. There are things that we have to take with us, aren't there? We, we can't do anything about them. We can't change the circumstances. And some of them are not perfect, ourselves included. And we might not be able to change some of them, so we may need to accept them. Accept circumstances. Accept some of the failures of the past. I'm not, I'm not talking about accepting sin. I'm talking about its consequences. Maybe relationships, maybe conditions. I'm sure you could think of other things as well. But the point here, friends, is this that God was going to do something new. If we look at uh, the beginning of chapter 9, verse 2 And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand are they delivered. This was new. Some of these things were very different conditions from what Noah had known before. We read that they may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. You see, the intention was for good. The intention was for um, them, them to be fruitful. And our desire would be, wouldn't it, that our service would be fruitful. But here's a warning. We must always be careful of the enemy. We need to be watchful alongside our service. The Lord in the Gospels um, tells that parable of the wheat and the tares. In Matthew chapter 13, it's one of the parables that, that he tells there. And that, that parable reminds us of the busyness and of the craftiness of the wicked one. And friends, we must be watchful as we serve the Lord. Maybe there needs to be acceptance. Fourthly, we see adoration. Chapter 8 and verse 20, And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, took of every clean beast and every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Firstly, consider the context here. This was one family. Noah was leading that family. Here was the aftermath of of judgment. He, he could have focused on his own situation, but he got his eye off himself and on to the Lord. The one he had trusted in the face of coming judgment was the one he would trust for a new beginning. Something else to consider. There was no abundance here, but Noah still offered sacrifice. Again, remember the context. One man, his wife, his three sons, their wives, Animals sufficient to keep their seed alive on the earth. Everything else had been destroyed. But Noah took of what was saved alive and offered sacrifice to the Lord. We read of every clean beast and every clean fowl. Sacrifice. It meant something. He put it on the altar. Everything else had been destroyed. He had taken a limited amount onto the ark, but he did not hold back. He sacrificed unto the Lord. Can I ask you, friend, have you lost things in the past year? Have you lost things in recent years? Maybe over many years. Loss of possessions. Loss of salary. Loss of employment. Loss of wealth. Maybe loss of friends. Loss of family. Loss of health. 
The list could go on and on, but like Noah, will you still build an altar unto the Lord? Easier said than done, I appreciate that. Consider Noah's perspective. His focus wasn't on what had been destroyed. His focus was on the grace of God. Thinking ahead, we, we don't know what will be in store for any of us through 2022, but will we resolve to learn from Noah's response here and follow his example? Will we offer sacrifice to the Lord? Will we worship the Lord as Noah did in thankfulness for his mercy and for his grace toward us at all times and in all circumstances? We look down at verses 21 and 22. Let's take time to read them again. The Lord smelled a sweet savor. The Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite anymore everything living as I've done. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. I want you to note something with me this morning. What man's condition had been like prior to the flood? We're able to turn back and read about that. And you know, the description that the Lord gives here is not much different. The imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. And therefore, the promise that follows only serves to emphasize the mercy of God. Well, what a difference true sacrifice can make on smelling that sweet savor from the sacrifice that Noah offered. The Lord promises not to curse the ground anymore for man's sake. What type of sacrifice was it? It was burnt offerings. It was sacrifice for sin in that sense. Surely, surely that those sacrifices point forward to Christ. And, and now we look back to that ultimate sacrifice for sin as we seek to be faithful to God. Christ died for our sin. Christ gave his life on that cross that you and I might live. Did it for us. All for us. And Paul says to the Ephesians, be ye therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Are we serious about our walk with God? Fifthly, I want you to see assurance. Let's read from chapter 9 and the first seven verses. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hand are they delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. But flesh with the, the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. And surely your blood of your lives will I require. <clears throat> at the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. And you be ye fruitful, and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth, and multiply therein. You see, here we find the, the conditions of the covenant that God would now establish with Noah. Those conditions were, were what we have just read, to repopulate the earth. To have dominion over the animals, which would now fear man. There was a new diet. Animals now becoming part of that diet. Eating of blood would be forbidden. Capital punishment would be introduced. And there was the promise that the earth would never again be destroyed by flood. Friends, that's different, isn't it? So different in many ways to what God had said to Adam way back in the very beginning. Adam was instructed to be fruitful and multiply on the earth and to subdue it. Noah was not instructed to subdue it. That was not possible because of the fall. I'd encourage you to study the, the covenants that are found in Scripture. Mark the distinctions. Mark man's failure. But above all, discover the mercy and the grace of God. Wonderful. Wonderful. Verses 12 to 15, and God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud. 
and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. This was a promise of God for perpetual generations, the very assurance of God himself, the token of the covenant. We're also aware of it, aren't we? The bow, the bow in the cloud. But I want you to see something this morning that sometimes we miss. It is his bow. It is his bow. It's more than a scientific occurrence when it rains. It's an evidence of the mercy and grace of God. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. Friends, put yourself for a moment in Noah's position once again. He had come through the flood, a flood that had never been experienced before. The clouds had gathered and had broken and unleashed a torrent in which every one but Noah and his immediate family had been destroyed. Every animal other than what had entered into the ark had been destroyed. Can you imagine having witnessed those events? How would you feel the next time clouds gathered above your head? But God provides assurance. He makes a promise. When clouds come, friend, clouds of danger, clouds of despair, clouds of doubt, his grace remains. And it often becomes clearer to us against the backdrop of those clouds. His promise remains. The bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. You know, we normally consider the rainbow from our perspective as we look upon it. And it's good to do so when we find assurance in, in that itself. However, note what God says here. I will look upon it. God looks upon the bow too. In fact, that's the perspective that is emphasized in these verses of Scripture. God says, I will remember. I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant. Friends, what great assurance. The God of all the earth has spoken. He has promised he will be merciful, and he will not recant, and that covenant is still in effect. It's an everlasting covenant, but we can also look to an even greater covenant that has been established. We look to the new covenant as believers in Christ. It was ratified at the cross where Christ endured the judgment of God in our place. And the believer is redeemed and reconciled to God on the basis of that once for all sacrifice for sin. Friend, the covenant wherewith we are sanctified. Praise his name. See the final thing with me this morning. Look at admonition. Chapter 9, verses 20 to 21. And Noah began to be an husband man, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. There's a warning here. It's a warning about sin. Even Noah, even after all that had happened, even after he had found grace in the eyes of the Lord, what a dreadful thing he did. What dreadful consequences that ensued. Friends, we rejoice in the grace of God, but we can't play fast and loose with it. The word of God is solemn. The word of God is serious. And we are responsible. Our conduct is important. These are, there, there are consequences for sin. The consequences of Noah's sin and Adam's sin and Abraham's sin and many more. Some of them continue to this day. And ours will be no different. There's a danger, you know, that we can get lost in the wonder of the account of Noah because of the nature of the events that are recorded here for us. But may we take a step back. May we understand the circumstances, realize the responsibilities that he faced and that we may learn from them. He faced a new year like no other that has come around since. He faced a new beginning. And as we have moved into this new year, perhaps a new beginning in some sense, may we learn from his experience assessment of what has gone before and what we face going forward. Adherence to the Word of God. 
acceptance of our circumstances, whether they be good or bad. Adoration of the Lord of the Word. Assurance in the mercy, the grace, and the promises of the eternal God. But admonition to keep sin and temptation at bay, that we may remain faithful. May God bless his word to our hearts this morning. We are going to sing a closing hymn together, standing to sing, Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Father, we draw into thy presence again, and we want to thank thee for the words of this hymn, thank thee for the truths that are contained within it. Father, we consider drawing near into thy presence, going to be with thee, seeing thee on thy judgment throne. Father, we pray that we will not lose rewards at that judgment throne. Help us to be faithful as we've been considering this morning in connection with Noah and the circumstances he faced, and for every individual here this morning, whatever circumstances they face, having entered this another year, we pray, our God, that they would trust in thee, that we would sacrifice unto thee in our service and our lives. Father, we would know the blessing, the promises, and the faithfulness of God once again. We ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus, and for his sake, and his glory alone. Amen.